the most fun I have at work is collecting postcards from cemeteries off of eBay and at uh, garage sales. <laughs> um, good afternoon. This presentation is essentially phase two of a 10-year project by the National Cemetery Administration to address the needs of the 32nd Indiana Infantry Monument. Created in er early 1862, it is the oldest Civil War monument uh, that we know of. Phase one, conservation of the original artifact, was presented by Conservation Solutions, Inc. at the Nashville Na Nationwide Cemetery Summit uh, in 2009. Phase two, which I'll tell you about, is about the creation of a successor monument uh, that we placed back in Louisville's Cave Hill National Cemetery uh, in Kentucky. NCA and its advisors and stakeholders, including prime contractor Heritage Preservation, Inc., um, strive to find the right word for what we aim to achieve. It's not a replica or a facsimile. It's not a replacement, and it's not really new. We agreed that it was the successor 32nd Indian Infantry Monument, and it was dedicated in 2011. But before I go there, I want to give you a brief recap <laughs> of phase one. And this is a remarkable monument. In the two decades before the Civil War, approximately 1.5 million Germans immigrated to the United States. The majority settled in the industrialized north for the job opportunities, in particular in Pennsylvania, the Ohio River Valley, and the Midwest cities. After the Civil War started, a handful of northern states established union regiments consisted entirely of German immigrants. The 32nd Indian Infantry was one of these. Organized in Indianapolis during summer 1861, recruits came from Indianapolis and Cincinnati. That fall, the regiment marched to Louisville to join uh, the Army of the Ohio, and the troops' first action was on December 17, 1861, at the ba Battle of Rowlett's Station outside of Munfordville, 70 miles south of Louisville. And there's a map here that puts this in perspective for you. The battle was small in scope, um, and it aimed at keeping a Green River bridge out of Confederate hands. The 32nd Indian Infantry succeeded, but 13 men were killed. Private August, August Bludner, as it's pronounced, we learned, uh, of the 32nd carved a monument to mark the graves of these men while the regiment was camped at the battle site for approximately six weeks. Uh, this is during the winter. He used uh, the only stone available, a substandard St. Genevieve limestone. The inscription is in German. Today we know this stone contains a significant amount of iron oxide that over time reacts to moisture by expanding, allowing uh, the surface to fracture. The monument marks the graves of 13, I'm sorry, 11 of the 13 soldiers. And a small fence uh, initially was constructed around the site. And we know this based on the drawing I'm showing you by Captain Adolf Metzner. And he labeled this burial place for its victims at the 32nd Indiana. Blender uh, was studied to be a sculptor in Germany before immigrating uh, to the United States in 1949. He worked here as a stone cutter and carpenter. He survived the war, but no other works are attributed to him that we know of. At war's end, the quartermaster general of the army undertook the task of locating remains of all Union soldiers scattered across this theater and reinterred them into what were new national cemeteries. So in 1861, the army moved the, the 11 bodies uh, and the monument Private Bledner created Cave Hill National Cemetery. And this is an uh, early map of the cemetery, and the, the, the monument is shown uh, by the arrow. The National Cemetery here is embedded in the private Cave Hill uh, Cemetery, if you're familiar with it. It's a beautiful uh, rural cell burial ground uh, b uh, established in 1848. Here the monument was placed on a new base uh, made of a much higher quality Bedford limestone. Uh, that was inscribed in English, quote, uh, in memory of the first victims of the 32nd Regiment Indiana Volunteers who fell at the Battle of Rowlett Station December 17, 1861. And I'm showing you that on the, on the screen. 
now jump ahead about 140 years. The poor quality stone and environmental and man-made impact had led to severe deterioration. By 2004, more than half the inscription was gone because the base was still in very good condition. NCA's efforts to stabilize, protect, and deal with the material failures in situ were futile. With input from subject matter experts, we decided to relocate the monument into a climate controlled facility. And I want to point out uh, a few um, key points about this notable inscription. It is in German in this uh, fracteur style script. It briefly describes uh, the battle, lists the names of the 13 men, their birth dates, and birthplaces. The central frieze contains an eagle with outstretched wings clutching a cannon. And the eagle is flanked by American flags, an olive sprig, and an oak branch, traditional um, on, uh, sort of American iconic images. But the combination of familiar American imagery and the old world German lettering creates sort of a delicious tension um, about time and place and culture. And it elevates the monument's significance. Moving forward quickly, <laughs> uh, and read this from um, top left clockwise. On December 17, 2008, the 147th anniversary of the Battle of Rowett Station, we moved the monument indoors for conservation. And it was formally delisted from the National Register at that time. In 2009, it was cleaned and treated to consolidate friable and loose fragments. At NCA, uh, which had no space to exhibit this building um, at the cemetery or even nearby, entered into a long-term agreement, a loan agreement with the Fraser History Museum. Uh, they changed their name since we entered into the agreement in downtown Louisville, and it was installed here in 2010. All the time we were working on the old monument, the original monument, NCA was anticipating the successor monument. Criteria included hand carving to capture the character and texture of the original, preferably in Indiana limestone of the same color. Thanks to period publications, we had two, and only two, excellent sources for the inscription. I'm showing you details of both. Um, on the uh, right is a 1955 photo from the Louisville Courier, and on the left is a detail from an 1871 article from the German language, the Louisville Enziger newspaper. Um, some term, turns of phrase uh, that, that, that are carved in the uh, monument demonstrate the immigrant's sort of lack of familiarity of his new home. And, it, and it, it, he, uh, as he's describing our country, he calls it the Republic of the United States of North America. And the, de the depiction of the eagle is sort of a, a long chicken-like neck. <laughs> We, we were sort of laughing about this a long time ago, um, is consistent with other German-American artists uh, working in, in this country around 1860. Um, NCA aimed to, comp to create a modern monument, uh, although we had this uh, sort of inspirational original to, to follow, but we wanted these two to look alike, uh, to at least to, to, to create a, a strong visual relationship between them. So we posed three design alternatives to Kentucky officials who we were consulting with, the community which were very um, interested in uh, both the old and the old monument and what we're going to do with it um, as part of our, our consultation process. And we um, went through a, a public meeting process in Louisville and people came and, and we shared three options for them. I'm only showing you two. The first one would be an exact replica, German on one side, nothing on the back, no interpretation. And we had these two um, that we presented. And one, uh, the one at the top is basically the existing monument with uh, the English translation on the rear and a date and a, 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 a largely generic rectangular version of this um, that would not at all way be confused with the original. Um, it was clear from the meeting um, that the, the top version was the one that people wanted to go with. Okay. 
once the monument's appearance was essentially determined, a search for the carver began. Uh, physical samples submitted by prospective vendors were an essential means for selecting the most qualified person or persons. We received three samples as part of the bidding process. And um, those are the three, and I, I'm giving you, I'm sh illustrating them to you in this format because you can see them uh, next to each other. I'm not showing you the two that did not win, <laughs> uh, if you want to call it that. Um, the, the, the three were included in an exhibit um, uh, that was curated by Ann Tate uh, called The Art of the Marble Memorial Historic and Contemporary. And this was um, briefly displayed at the Rutland Art Association Chafee Art Center in, in Vermont, which was uh, an interesting turn on, this, on our process. And that is the, um, the sample that we selected, and you know, the, the carver we selected is um, the person who carved the, the detail there. Um, Heritage Preservation um, contracted with Nicholas Benson, owner of the John Stevens shop, established 1705 in Newport, Rhode Island, on our behalf. Benson is a third generation master of hand letter carving whose crisp and elegant technique is perfectly su uh, 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 um, suited to our project because we had this very unique um, script to recreate. And I, he has so many honors, I simply excerpt from his bio. <laughs> um, and it was a quite an, uh, an amazing process because he managed to squeeze our project in between other commissions like the letters on the MLK Junior and National Monuments in Washington. And he had uh, just been named a MacArthur Fellow and we were feeling amazingly lucky at this point. To ensure the accuracy of the in English inscription, uh, which had never really been vetted, uh, it, it had been, uh, it appeared in newspapers later, but we needed to verify that uh, the German was going to proper English. We asked the Goethe Institute, a nonprofit German cultural center in Washington, to translate the 1871 um, Anziger newspaper article for us. And their linguists were really, um, were, were incredible. They advised us on the subtle uh, choices, uh, what words we want to use, um, the identification and spelling of some towns which no longer existed or might exist, but the spellings have changed. Um, borders had changed, uh, place names were, some place names were uh, difficult to identify, um, but we took all of their information and their suggestions and we made the best educated guess in cases like that. And Benson laid out the inscriptions based on um, those two sources I shared, and we had to review this in German, character by character, you know, is there an umlaut there, all that. I, I don't speak German. <laughs> um, and so that was, it was very, uh, it was a challenge. Um, uh, meanwhile, you know, Benson was an artist as, as part of this process, and so he had ideas about things, how things should be laid out. Um, and he, um, some of his, his artistic license, if you will, included filling the ends of some of the rows, the, the names. Um, these are the, that's pretty, pretty clear. That these are the, the lists in two columns of the men uh, named, where they were born, the date that they were born. And he introduced these sort of swirls, or, uh, which we thought were a little heavy handed until we got him down to a single swirl. And if there was, uh, he didn't have to automatically jam one in at the end of each line. Uh, we said, you know, if you have X number of, if there's enough space there, you can put it, but eh, you don't have to put it back in there. So it was sort of a, a dialogue with him. Um, and, uh, but he assured us that it, this sort of, um, uh, this, this design feature, um, was appropriate to this kind of carving, um, but because the actual thing was wrong, it was gone in most cases. We we weren't sure that it existed, but we were. We accepted this as, as, as an opportunity. Um, Benson and other carvers in his studio worked on this. Uh, to tell you the truth, we don't know how much work Benson personally put into this versus. Um, the carvers in his studio, 
and it was not important to him to tell us and we were not in a position to really to ask him that. Uh, but, but I have to say it moved very quickly uh, once it finally, you know, w when we launched. Um, this is the translation on the back. Um, and, and this was very important for us to introduce as a, as a way to um, share with visitors, people who go to Cave Hill, either descendants, uh, otherwise. And that information was not there previously. There was an interpretive sign there, but uh, I don't think the whole translation was there. And so this was the major difference between old and new. Um, the monument was installed at Cave Hill in September 2011, and it went down on the same location over before and then had for the new one. And here um, the crane was, was obviously rolling the die onto the bay. Uh, Benson drove this out personally, and he's uh, down there setting it. The two blocks are joined by stainless steel pins and mortar. And this is the final uh, in site, on site, um, with the, the frieze and the German inscription. Um, and the, the base is identical to the, uh, to the original. And on the back, it's, it's kind of hard to, to, uh, to read, um, but it's a, it's a pretty standard font. This is obviously it's not a fracture, it's, it's a just generic standard light, light uh, letter style, which I'm sure he's horrified to hear me say, um, because there's no such thing. And the date is um, on the base. Um, there had been um, an interpretive sign in the area. Uh, I, I honestly can't tell you the details of that. But throughout this whole process, we put in a, a new interpretive panel. You know, if we, if we covered up the monument for some effort to uh, conserve it on site, um, when we removed it so people weren't alarmed. Um, and we also wanted to, to point visitors to the original monument, which um, by that time was in the, the museum in downtown Louisville. It's not far from the cemetery. Um, and so we wanted uh, people to see both. And then we um, put a final panel in here um, once the, the new monument, uh, the successor monument, was in place. Um, it's a very cold day. On December 16th, 2011, and that was almost 150 years to the day of the Battle of Rowlett Station. And we dedicated it um, at the cemetery, obviously, and put a, a wreath laying. Um, some of the individuals you see in the picture are descendants of men who were in the 32nd Regiment. There were some sons of Union veterans um, doing the reenactor form thing. Um, local stakeholders who really kept um, the agency moving forward. They were, it's a small but very active German-American community that wanted this to keep going. And we have VA officials here as well. Um, by conserving the original 32nd Indiana Monument and fabricating a successor for the cemetery, NCA uh, w aimed to honor the memory of the 13 soldiers who had immigrated to America and died um, defending the country. And I think that's a, an, an important story. They also preserved one of, the, one of only a few, one of the few monuments created during the Civil War. This was after the war uh, ended. Um, but, it, but the content of this monument really, uh, I think, is, is most important because it reflects the country's di diversity at the time. <laughs> Uh, this German-American who had harvested this in, in a native language, and I think that makes it quite exceptional. Um, Nick Benson um, is, was a master carver, is a master carver, and this work is really an ode to Bledner's, um, Bledner's intent, um, and yet it stands on its own as well. It is also one of many projects that NCA has is pleased to have completed um, leading up to and during our commemoration of the Civil War sesquicentennial. And uh, this is really just sort of a tip of the information um, I could share with you. We actually have more about this project on our website than almost any other single project. And so um, that's our website and the history pages uh, are there. 
That's all I want to thank you very much.